A school in Canada is caught removing almost every library book published before 2008 in the name of, quote, inclusivity and equity. The Heritage Foundation, Foundation suggests that classical education could be a remedy to the loneliness epidemic in America. And the Florida Board of Governors votes to approve the classic learning test as an accepted admissions test at all state public universities. This is Office Hours with Jeremy Tate. Welcome to a very special episode of Anchored. In fact, it is the first episode in a new series that we're calling Office Hours with Jeremy Tate. My name is Soren Schwab. I'm the vice president here at the Classic Learning Test. And we're going to bring you the latest news in the educational renewal movement. And I'm here with none other than CLT's CEO and founder, Mr. Jeremy Tate. Soren, I, I am so pumped about this. You know, we talk about news in the movement, the classical and movement all the time together. And I think at some point we just had this idea of like, what if we just kind of make this uh, a 10 minute, 15 minute uh, kind of news uh, feature every week. So it's thrilled to be getting started with this brother. I love it. I love it. Sometimes, you know, late night conversations after 10 minutes, we should have recorded this. So here we are <laughs> recording this. That's right. Uh, top story here. We're talking about banning books, not a, not a, not a, not a new thing per se, but this one is interesting. So, so this, this, this library in a, in a public school district in Canada uh, is not just removing books, but particularly books published in or before 2008 uh, around kind of their new equity-based process. So they're calling it weeding out books. Uh, seems a little strange, doesn't it? So, Soren, this is straight up like Babylon Beak. I mean, can you make this up? <laughs> Anything just before 2008 is going gonna, is gonna to get the chop, this arbitrary date. I guess they want to make sure that Everything the kids are seeing, you know, came about during their own lifetime uh, and that they're not going to have any connection uh, to the thousands of years of history before that. It's absolutely insane. So essentially, goodbye classics, goodbye anything that kind of kind of what, what Hirsch would call cultural literacy, right? It's all kind of out the door. Sure. And I think it underestimates students. And you may have experienced this in the classroom, but when you're showing students, hey, this book just came out brand new, super relevant. We think that that has a big impact on students, but they, they know it's going to be irrelevant in another two or three years as well. Versus if you share with them the Odyssey and you say, hey, for more than 2000 years, this book, this story has been passed down and now it's your turn. That that dignifies a student. It draws them into something bigger than themselves. Yeah. Yeah. I, I struggle a little bit, too, Jeremy, with like just even using banning, the banning of books. Uh, you know, when you go to Barnes and Noble, there's like the banned book section where you can <laughs> literally purchase the banned books. Um, but 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 a lot of it is about, you know, removing. So so sometimes not even what, what we put in, but but actually what we're removing from what we don't want our students to read. And it seems a little asinine to sc heavily scrutinize books written before 2008. You would think it's the opposite, right? Hey, this book just came out. We don't really know if it's going to, so maybe we should yeah. scrutinize it, but but that's fine, right? But but the old stuff, we, we got to scrutinize, like make it make sense. Now, I, so now, I'd be interested in your take on this. Can it have the opposite impact though, potentially? I mean, when, when they have banned books historically, you think of like Catcher in the Rye, it actually kind of added some, like, this is this is dangerous, you know? The, the new university in Austin, Pano Canales' new college, they have a summer program just on banned books. Young people are kind of drawn to this. What do you think? I would think so. I would, And I think when I talk to Barnes & Noble, that's the appeal, right? It's like this forbidden fruit that we want to taste, mm. right? Like, why, why was this book at some point banned or why was it um, at least deemed deemed controversial? Uh, and I think I'm, I'm okay with that, right? And, and I think we, we have to look at age appropriateness. There are a lot of books that should not be banned but maybe should also not be in the grammar school reading section of the library, right? And so sure, I think sometimes, sure. you know, when, when you talk about things that are happening in Florida, and so much about it, it's not about canceling books or banning books. It's about when is the appropriate time to read a certain book. I think that I can get behind, but just to say, oh, this was written before 2008, we should yeah, probably chop right. it, right? Yeah. Seems, seems a bit off. Yeah. yeah. Oh, well. Uh, let's get to our second story. And, and this this article came across my desk. I absolutely love it. Uh, Rachel Camber, 
uh, Heritage Foundation. Uh, the title is Classical Education's Remedy for America's Loneliness Epidemic. She calls it an epidemic. Uh, and so a little bit of context. Uh, but you know this because we both read Ben Sass's The Vanishing of the American Adult, is that in-person social engagement has been decreasing across all age groups. Uh, and, and, and the average number of close friends that Americans have gets smaller and smaller uh, every year. And then she makes the case that classical education could be a remedy to that. Uh, knowing what you know about, about the classical renewal movement, uh, what do you think of that? Yeah, you know, I, I was so thrilled to see this article and, and a huge shout out to Heritage. Heritage is on offense, as, as Dr. Kevin Roberts, the, the president there, puts it. Uh, absolutely. I mean, we, we, we witnessed a record, all time record of suicides in America in 2022. The numbers just came out and it beat the old record by over 5 percent, more than 50,000. And we know there's a direct correlation between screen time and severe depression, anxiety and even suicide as well. Actually, every hour I saw increases the likelihood uh, by 9%. We're talking about average screen time for young people now, about eight hours per day. And this, wow. this older form of education, which removes students from screens, draws them into discussion about the things that matter most. It creates real friendship. I, I think Heritage was right on the money with this. And, and, I, and I keep on thinking about the kind of the, the difference between being alone and being lonely, you know, mm. and you can be surrounded by, I mean, we're, we're, we constantly feel like we are connected, right? But so many people are lonely because they don't, they lack those, those deeper relationships. Uh, and, and I wonder, you know, my experience in, in, in the charter school, um, and I know a lot of folks in the, in the classical schools, there is not this overemphasis on, on just the practicality of things, right? You just got to, you know, take these AP classes to get this number, to get this piece of paper, to go to this school. Totally. So much about it now is just about that. Well, as Lewis said, friendship is kind of unnecessary, right? When you think of it in, in mm. these practical terms, well, are we sending the wrong signals to to the next generation, right? That maybe maybe it's, it's you know, friendship is a lot of work yeah. too. Is it is it worth it? Yeah, and, and you know, you, you two are probably far more schools than I have, but I, I think there's something really special about the relationships between faculty. And this has a, an impact on the whole school. It has a huge impact on the students. When the faculty are close, when they have a community that spills over into the life and culture of the school as a whole, and this is born out of a common love, right? And so when they have this shared love for the great books, for these great texts, for this education that's built around the formation of the whole human person, I I think about these schools and, and I feel like I, I tour them and I you just see genuine friendships among the administration, among the parents. I mean, a place like Veritas, where we've all been and, and visited, it's a community that Keith Nix is building down there. It's not just a school. It's a whole community. Uh, I, I was so encouraged to see this article. Yeah, it makes it makes a big difference for sure. Well, the last story here and, 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 and I... Cautioning our listeners here, not every episode is going to be like self-promotional, <laughs> self-promotional CLT. But but if we're talking about educational news, uh, this one is a big one. And of course, we're talking about uh, the recent uh, decision by the Board of Governors in Florida to accept CLT uh, as an admissions test for for all 12 uh, major Florida universities uh, and, and thereby for the first time breaking up the duopoly uh, of ACT, SAT. It's been around since the 50s, the ACT since the 50s, SAT even even longer. So uh, I'm sure a lot of our listeners heard about, you know, CLT and the big news in Florida, but I'm sure they're interested in a little bit of behind the scenes about these last few months, Jeremy. So to yeah. share a little bit with us, uh, just kind of what, what transpired and, and some of the larger impact there. Sure, yeah. And sort of, it'd be hard to uh, to kind of remove how, how personal, uh, you know, th this is for all of us here, you know, in the office in Annapolis. I mean, it'd be difficult to put into words what a kind of big deal this is. I mean, this is the university system. They've got two in the top 20. I think maybe the only state that's got two, both the University of Florida now at number four, U.S. News and World Report. And we can debate these on another episode, the value of U.S. News and World yeah. Report. <laughs> Please. Florida State, though, at number 20, an incredible system uh, managed by a board of governors that is very, very focused on educational excellence. And this is what I thought was so exciting about CLT. And the way they viewed CLT is wanting to be a state that establishes a high standard for academic excellence. And CLT is a, another way 
uh, to get there. And these are not test optional colleges. Every student in Florida uh, it, to qualify for Bright Futures and graduation requirements are using these tests. And as you've described it before, these tests are often detours uh, from if you're Naples Classical or True North in Florida, these are big detours that are not familiar. They're doing the weird common core math. I think this is a, a big win, not just for CLT, of course, but I think for the students uh, at these great schools in Florida. Oh, that's that's well put. Yeah. I mean, it's it's really for the students, for the parents. The word I often hear is compromise, that they feel like so often we, we kind of have to compromise on maybe we have to stop teaching to prepare for the test, or we have to even teach things that we don't really believe in. Uh, and so I think uh, the the this is a big win for, for school reform, for school choice, for educational freedom. Because uh, ultimately, when you think about it, Jeremy, we can talk about school choice, right? And if you have the choice to be a, a Treasure Coast classical, right? You have this beautiful curriculum, you have a chance to hire these amazing teachers, but you're still validate, you have to validate yourself based on scores on a test that is fundamentally disconnected from your educational oh, yeah. principles, from your curriculum, right? It's like, Something's not quite right. Are we truly free in that? Uh, and so I think that is the barrier that that this decision has removed. That doesn't mean that every school in Florida is all of a sudden doing CLT, but the ones that are missionally aligned and that feel like, hey, this is a better reflection are now able to do that without compromising. I think that's a big, big win for everyone, not just for CLT. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the media coverage with this, Soren, I mean, for us, it, it's kind of blown our mind. I mean, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, Inside Higher Ed, Chronicle of Higher Ed, on and on and on. And we've seen that some of these articles, you know, it's very clear who does their homework and who doesn't, right? Yeah. You've had the haters wanting to just simplify this. And this is a DeSantis, Christian, Christian nationalism, you know, kind of a test. But I think even the folks, people like uh, even um, uh, New York Times, Dana Goldstein, right? Um, what was the other one uh, that came out, the, the, the very left publication, Soren? Oh, Mother Mother Jones? Yeah, even Mother Jones, you know, Ke Kiera Butler did her homework there and thought, wow, th this is a kind of education that is focused on cultivating wonder, cultivating curiosity, um, helping students to learn to be patient and generous and kind. Who doesn't want this kind of education? And so it, it's a fun moment. I mean, I think we're right now living through kind of a tipping point of classical ed, and it's incredible that CLT gets to be a part of that. Yeah, in a way, we're 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 kind of at the nexus of a lot of this. I think that that's why this office hour with Jeremy Tate is going to be a smashing success because we hear about a lot what's going on in the space uh, and really want to share this with our wonderful audience. Uh, and so before uh, before we, we we log off for the day here, uh, Jeremy, give our reader a recommendation. What are you currently reading? What do you recommend to them? Yes. All right, Soren. So I am currently reading. Uh, I believe it's Isaac Watts' new biography on Elon Musk. And, you know, talk about the way literature impacts a young child. And, and, and Elon talks about uh, being blessed to grow up kind of before the Internet age. I mean, here's a guy who created PayPal. But, you know, as an eight-year-old, nine-year-old, he wasn't connected. He was unplugged. And he's reading The Hitchhiker, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. He's reading The Lord of the Rings over and over. His imagination is being shaped, uh, you know, by these these great books and you know, for better or worse, I know there's a lot of Elon fans and Elon haters out there, but in terms of this kind of education, uh, really catapulting a young person into a successful future, uh, it's a good, I think, testimony to that. And also just the way that um, we're living through a wild disruption right now, not just in education, yeah. but across all these different sectors. So I would highly, highly uh, recommend it. So what are you, what are you reading? For? You know, I placed it on hold. Um, I'm, I'm like number 77 in the library, so maybe, maybe I do have to have to go ahead and and uh, and, and and buy it. Uh, I just finished Great Expectations, Charles Dickens, um, and and, okay. and I had to okay. humble I had to humble myself. I've always been an American lit guy, and and uh, and so what, what, ah, Dickens. You know, why do I need read Dickens? But mm. I think the longer I'm around people here at CLT, and 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 just just the just amazing they are. Like. Mm. Think in Chesterton, Democracy of the Dead, right? There, there are much smarter people that came before me that have deemed Dickens a great white writer. And if I don't like Dickens, that's a problem with me, not with Dickens, right? And so I picked it back up. It was just blown away. And so uh, okay. if everyone has maybe read it the first time and wasn't a big fan, you know, it's worth picking up a second. It's, it, is, it is great. Between Great Expectations and A Tale of Two Cities, if you had to recommend one, what is it going to be? So yeah, I think, if, I think if you're struggling to get into, into Dickens, start with Tale of Two Cities. It's a bit more accessible um, and a bit shorter. 
Um, but I think uh, if I had to pick one as the greater book, I would say Great Expectations. So. Wonderful. Well, well, this was this was a great, uh, great first episode, Jeremy. Uh, to our audience, if you have, if you see stories, newspaper articles uh, around education that that you would like Jeremy and me to discuss, send us an email, uh, anchored at cltexam.com. We'd be sure uh, we'd be sure to cover it. Uh, Jeremy Tate, thank you so much for joining today. Lauren, thanks for thanks for being on.